Okay, welcome to the SICA cast. This is Fred Iantorno, Executive Director of SICA. We have a great program for you today, Scheduling and Best Practices. Today's presenters are Mike Anderson and Frank Laviola. There is no one in the collision repair industry who hasn't heard of Mike Anderson. He is the acclaimed champion of everything that is or could be right about the industry. As one of the most knowledgeable people in his field, he is a sought-after speaker, author, and consultant who can discuss and teach on a wide range of topics relating to everything from uh, politics affecting collision repair to research, researching repairs properly via technology to giving and getting the best from insurers and to performing an exact correct repair, just to name a few things. If there's anything Mike doesn't know, he'll find out about it. Mike is a former owner of Wagon Wheel, pardon me, Wagon Work Collision uh, Centers, two highly acclaimed uh, shops located in Alexandria, Virginia. Currently, Mike owns and operates Collision Advice, an industry research, reference, and consulting business. In addition, Mike also serves as a facilitator for Alexa's highly recognized Business Council 20 groups in both the U.S. and Canada. He also facilitates numerous courses for the Alexa Performance Services Education Series. In 2014, Mike was homeless for 20 days, was home for less than 20 days. He wasn't homeless, <laughs> was home for less than 20 days, referring, uh, preferring to spend his time traveling over North America, teaching and serving in, in advisory boards and committees, and generally live, uh, living in support of the industry. Speaking with passion, as well as firsthand experience, Mike teaches pertinent cutting-edge management and operational techniques. But that's not all. He is guaranteed to leave you laughing and highly motivated as well. Frank Laviola is a former SICA executive board member and frequently, frequently speaker at the SICA conferences and SICA cast. He is actively involved in SICA and currently serves as the chair of the SICA marketing committee. Frank has spent the last 23 years uh, working for Enterprise Holdings in many capacities, including uh, AVP of Collision Industry Relations and Strategic Sales, and was a pioneer for Enterprise in Germany, serving as Vice President and General Manager. Frank is passionate about helping the collision industry and especially in repairs move forward and grow their businesses. To that end, he is now president of his own consulting company, Body Shop Solutions, LLC. It is my pleasure to turn this over uh, to Mike Anderson. Mike? Well, thank you, Fred. I appreciate it. And thank you to Sika uh, for giving me the opportunity to share my passion and insight on scheduling. So today's course title is called Scheduling Best Practices. Um, you know, the first thing I want to talk about scheduling is that it's one of the most challenging aspects of running a physical repair facility. And the reason it's the most challenging aspect is due to the unpredictable nature of work, meaning we can't foresee how many people are going to wreck a car tonight or this weekend. Also, the variables are the types of jobs we're going to get, like is it going to be a drivable vehicle or a non-drive, um, is it an exotic vehicle? And so all of these things really make scheduling really challenging, which in turn makes it challenging to run a physical repair facility. But what I want to point out is that while scheduling is difficult, it is not impossible. And my goal today is to maybe just create some awareness and my desired outcome is that maybe you might just pick up on one or two things that might you think you help you to think differently about scheduling. Now, what are some of the benefits of a scheduling system? Well, the first is if we schedule properly, we will have more even flow in our consistency, meaning that we'll have the amount of, same amount of jobs coming in every day with the same amount of jobs going out. It also allows us to have balanced and better use of our resources. It means the spray booth not sitting empty till 10 o'clock, but we actually have a car to spray out at 8 o'clock in the morning, and also our frame machines don't just have a car in there every now and then. It absolutely reduces stress for everyone involved, from insurers to consumers to shops to technicians. Also, if your technicians are flat rate or, flat rate or commission, you'll tend to see that if you really in, embrace scheduling, you will see a much more consistent pay for your technicians versus their pay going up and going down obviously reduces cycle time, improves our touch time or hours per day, and last but not least, it will improve profitability, meaning that you will get to break even sooner in the month. Now, one of the things when I start talking about scheduling is a lot of people start telling me, well, well Mike, what about this? What about that? The thing is, is that they're starting to talk themselves out of something before they ever get the change or a chance. And so therefore, you need to stop that negative story you're telling yourself, whether you're an insurer or a shop. We just need to quit 
telling ourselves a negative story that scheduling cannot be done. In regards to those people that say, well, Mike, what about this and what about that? I think it's very important that you understand our goal is to build a system for the norm and not the exception. Now, in my mind, there's three types of appointments that we would schedule. The first is an estimate appointment. Well, we're going to schedule someone in to get an estimate. The second type of appointment that I used in my facility when I had them and I use with my consulting clients now is something called a DRA appointment or damage review appointment. That means that we have a consumer that has an estimate already from an insurance carrier. We're not a DRP, and we're going to bring that estimate in so we can actually see what type of job it needs, determine what types of parts we may need to pre-order, and then get them scheduled on the books. And last but not least, there's the drop-off appointment. In today's seminar, we are here to focus on scheduling the drop-off appointments. Now, I'd like to share with you a little bit about why I think people need a scheduling system. I'd like to share the story of a guy by the name of Shane Gaulle from PA Auto Body up in Canada. Shane was doing an average of about $200,000 a month in sales. His average cycle time, length of rental, keys to keys, according to Enterprise's Office Report, was 12 days. Well, what we did is we implemented a scheduling process within Shane's facility, and we immediately, within 30 days, saw his cycle time shrink from 12 days down to 10. So therefore, because we improved his cycle time by two days, which was a 16% increase, we actually saw his sales have a direct correlation where his sales went up 16% by $32,000 a month. Now, this is because he had capacity, meaning that he had a backlog of work. So obviously, if you don't have a backlog of work, it may not benefit you in, in, in regards to more sales. But in Shane's case, because he had more work hanging out there, and the fact that he was able to fix cars faster, he was able to bring those other customers in sooner, and we saw a direct correlation in a decrease of cycle time and an increase in sales. Now, what we did when we started working at Shane's shop was that we wanted to figure out what his workload is. So what we did is we actually took and we went statistically to grab some data from Shane's shop. And what we saw was that he brought in about 31 cars on a Monday. That's not one specific Monday, but all the Mondays in the course of a month. He took in about 22 cars on a Wednesday, 22 cars on a Tuesday, 13 on a Thursday, and 7 on a Friday. Now, when you look at his delivery, we see that while he took in 31 cars on a Monday, he was only delivering 10 on a Monday. And while he took in 22 on a Tuesday, he was only delivering 13. Now, again, Wednesdays, he did pretty well. He took in about the same amount of cars he delivered. Thursday, he took in less cars. He delivered more. Friday, he took in very little cars. He delivered more. Now, I'm sure that's the case in most of shops that you go into, or if you're a shop owner today, you're probably saying, Mike, this is what my shop looks like. Now, what we did with this is we actually took this and we put it on a graph. And what we did is we saw that the blue was all of his arrivals, and the green was all of his deliveries. So what we did is we developed a spreadsheet with the help of a guy by the name of Ron Pomato from the Salt Lake Coding Systems, where we developed a spreadsheet that we call a cycle time tracker. And what we did was we had Shane track in all the vehicles that he took in on Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays, and how many delivered. Now my first question to you is, in a perfect world, what should this line look like? If you said the line should be on top of each other, you're absolutely correct. Because what we're looking for is consistent flow or consistent scheduling. So in a perfect world, let's assume that your magic number was five cars a day. We'd want to see five coming in a day and five going out a day. In a perfect world, that line would be right over top of each other. But in this case, you'll see that it's a crisscross, meaning that we've taken a lot of cars Mondays and Tuesdays, and we don't deliver very many. And then Thursdays and Fridays, that's when everybody gets stressed, we're delivering all these cars. And unfortunately, this is the way the majority of the industry is right now. Now, what we did was, we started to view what his scheduling, his current model, was causing in the shop. And what we saw was that his painters were standing around on Monday and Tuesday. They didn't have a lot to do because the technicians were so busy taking cars apart to write estimates that they weren't putting anything in paint. Wednesday, all the cars started hitting paint. And then what happened was, because they had to get all these cars out by Friday, his painters are trying to paint cars, and the body men are trying to reassemble them and deliver them on the same day on Thursday or Friday. And that just created a lot of room for error and mistakes. And bottom line is Shane's shop was also hourly, and because it was hourly, his overtime kicked in on Wednesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays for his paint department, and that affected his gross profit. Now, in Shane's shop, he actually um, used ProfitNet. So while this uh, seminar is not an endorsement of ProfitNet, it was just the system that my clients were working with, and I chose to build this presentation around ProfitNet. So if you have a management system, just understand these same principles will apply no matter what management system you have. However, all of the examples in this seminar will be profit net. So what we did is we went into Shane's shop and we went into his profit net and we ran a report that was called cycle time load levels for last month. 
Now what this showed us from Shane Shop was that it popped up and said, do you want to add for additional filter conditions? And what we did was we said yes. And what we did is we said we only wanted to look at his data that was greater than or equal to $250. You see, Shane did a lot of just like small inspections that were $15 a piece. And we knew we had to filter those out because we didn't want to get false data. Once we did that, we were able to start to examine uh, Shane's information based off what we call his cycle time broken down into three categories. So cycle time is keys to keys, arms linked to rental through enterprise. But we break it down into three categories. Pre-repair, which is arrival to start. Repair, which is start to complete. And post-repair, which is completed to deliver. And what we saw was, we saw that on average, you'll see here, Shane, we had jobs broken into five categories. An ultra light, which for the rest of the seminar I'll refer to as a category one. A light I'll refer to as category two. A medium is category three. A heavy is category four. And an ultra heavy is category five. We saw that on his, his category one, ultra light, his pre-repair arrival to start date was one day or less. On his category twos, we saw that his arrival to start time was 1.3 days. Let's go down and look at his heavy, category fours. We saw from the time that vehicle arrived until we started on it was 2.6 days. Now, if you look at his repair portion of the cycle time, you will actually see that his repair portion, his technicians actually work pretty efficiently. And then we started to look at his post-repair, which is from the time the vehicle was completed until the vehicle was delivered. We saw that in some cases, from the time the technician got done with it until the estimator delivered it back to the customer, was anywhere from one to two and a half days. So what we found out was, because the technicians and the estimators were taking too many cars in on a Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, we found the paperwork was always chasing the car. And we found out because they had all these vehicles to carry on when they first came in on Monday or Tuesday, we found that they uh, were not getting to these cars. They were actually sitting. So we started to examine this cycle time again, pre-repair, repair, post-repair. Post Most other management systems, I know like CCC, one will also give you the same type of information. Now, what we did is we then ran a, a detailed report. So the report I just showed you right here was the summary report. What we did is we went next and we ran a detailed report. The detailed report showed us exactly which specific ROs were contributing to his delayed pre-repair and his delayed post-repair. So we saw here on a Category 3 that he had a pre-repair, which is a rival to start, that took 12 days. We then went and ran this report some more, and we saw that we actually had um, some other Category 4s that sat for six days, and five days, and six days. So what we realized is that there were some jobs that, even though they were loading all these cars up on Mondays and Tuesdays, they were actually sitting for anywhere from three to six days before anyone started on them because it was more than the shop could process. So there's three types of scheduling methods that I'm going to touch with you today. The first is the most basic method. It's the most easiest to do if you're not doing any type of scheduling at all. So if you're not doing any scheduling at all right now, the first way to just take a baby step would be figure out what your desired sales are per month. Let's say you want to do $200,000 a month in sales. Your average repair order is $2,000. Therefore, you need to do 100 cars a month. Well, if there's 20 working days in a month, then I know I need to bring in five cars a day, and I need to deliver five cars a day. Now, this is what it would look like. I bring in Mr. Smith's car in at 8 to 9, Mr. Nichols 9 to 10, Mr. Heavens 10 to 11, Ms. Gomez from 1 to 2, and Mr. Gonzalez from 3 to 4. And now what I'm doing is I just have consistently five cars every single day, and my goal is to deliver five. And if I do this, then I've got a very good chance of hitting my desired sales goal of $200,000. Now, there are some things about that method that don't always work so well. For example, you may take five hard hits in in one day, or maybe it's just five bumper jobs. So then what happens is you may not necessarily hit your sales goal. But at the end of the day, that method is better than not having any method of scheduling at all. Now, the next method I'm going to talk about is called my advanced method. This is my favorite method, and the shops that I know that embrace and utilize this method have seen sales double in some cases. I'll show you the collision centers, Long Island, New York. Big Sky Collision, Billings, Montana, North Haven Alder Body, North Haven, Connecticut. I, the names of shops I can give you are endless that have embraced this method that has worked for them. And that method is this. Another one is run a 12-month rolling history of all your sales. Find the month that you had your best sales. Then determine what categories of work did you deliver that month to hit your optimal goal. And then you break that down by the day. How many Category 1s I need Monday through Friday? How many Category 2s, 3s, 4s, or 5s? And last but not least, we want to create a, bit, create a visual signal that if we do get caught up in current, we can pull work in in real time. 
So let me share the story with you of a shop called the Collision Centers, North Haven, oh, I'm sorry, the Collision Centers in Long Island, New York. Uh, Joe Amaday was a client of mine, and he installed ProfitNet's management system in, in June of 2014. Now at the time, uh, Joe did not have 12 months worth of data because he only installed ProfitNet in, in June. And again, this is not an endorsement of ProfitNet. This, this, uh, this method I'm teaching you will work with any management system. It just happened to be that was the management system that Joe Amaday used. So we'll see here that when we looked at Joe's rolling six months of data, we saw that in October of 2014, he did $503,000 a month in sales. Now that was his best month out of all the past six months. So we said, okay, what do we need to do to replicate that month so we can hit that same amount of sales goals every single month? So what we did is we ran that report. We went into ProfitNet and we ran into financial and we took and we selected this and it was called his market analysis KPI report. And it showed us here that $503,000 was his best month out of the past six months. So then what we did is we said, okay, what we need to do is we need to figure out was there any small jobs that he did. Joe does a lot of inspections with his mechanical shop, $15, $20 a piece. He does alignments. And we said, we need to filter all those things out. So what we did is we went back in the profit net and we ran his cycle time arrival versus delivery report. And we filtered out all of those smaller jobs. Now you'll see here that what we did is we did not focus on the amount of jobs Joe was bringing into his facility. We only focused on the jobs that Joe was delivering for the facility. And we saw that for this month, when he did $500,000, you'll see the month of October. October, if you can see my cursor there, we ran it by that specific date for when he had a $500,000 month. And what we saw was that it told us how many Category 1s that he delivered, how many Category 2s he delivered, 3s, 4s, and 5s. And we saw that Joe's average cycle time was 6.2. So what we did is, when we ran this report, we focused for how many he took in of each specific category. So what we did is we saw that Joe to hit $500,000 a month in sales, Joe needs to deliver 48 Category 1s, known again as an ultralight, 24 Category 2s, 22 Category 3s, 17 Category 4s, and 119 Category 5s. Now when I saw this, I was like, wow, Joe, that's a lot of heavy hits. Are we sure this is right? I'll show you what we did next. So what we did is we said, okay, let's figure out what each category should be in hours. And what we determined was that a Category 1 was going to be 8 hours or less. Now, this eight hours includes body, frame, paint, and mechanical, all labor hours. Category two was going to be 8.1 to 16 hours. Category three, 16 to 32. Category four, and category five, as you can see on your screen right now. Now, the question a lot of people ask me is, Mike, how did you come up with these hours? Well, I'm going to share that with you. The first thing we did was we went into ProfitNet, where it said set up load levels. And we clicked it on that, and it allowed us to set how many labor hours we wanted each individual category to be. So that was predetermined or predefined by us. You can set that to whatever you want. So then what we did is we said, okay, well, Mike, how did you figure out that the average ROI was going to be 19 to 24 hours? Well, we know that if we have five categories, that whatever the average ROI is for a shop, that needs to be the category three, the one in the middle. So at that time, we reached out to Auditex, and Auditex told us what the average labor hours were for that shop. So you'll see right here in the state of New York, it showed that according to Auditex, the average estimate in the state of New York had 26.88 labor hours on it. We said, okay, well, that's one source. So then what we did is we reached out to our good friends at CCC, and Susanna Gotts was so nice to share some information with us. And we found out that according to CCC in 2013, that the average RO was around 22.5 hours. And then what we did is we reached out to our friends at Enterprise, an enterprise in conjunction with Mitchell International told us that their average RO for the state of New York was 25 hours. So we had three different sources that told us what the average RO was for the state of New York, right? So we had, you know, CTC, we had Mitchell, we had Auditex, and then we also actually called Enterprise. And at that time, uh, Frank Langola was with Enterprise, and he pulled this data for us. And he said, well, Mike, we don't break jobs down to five categories, but we break jobs down into four categories. So we were able to look at Joe Amaday at the collision centers, his history of work. So again, we're looking at statistical data that showed us how many categories 1s, 2s, 3s, or 4s that he did over a period of time. And then that's what we used to set what the average labor hours for each category was going to be for Joe's specific shop. Now again, it's very important that you understand not every shop in the United States of America is going to have the same hours for the same categories. CCC has shown us through some of their data 
that the average vehicle that has alternative substrate, such as aluminum, typically has twice as many labor hours on it than a vehicle that's made out of like just common steel. So we know that the different types of vehicles will affect your labor hours. We also know somebody that does a lot of exotic vehicles, uh, like a Porsche or Mercedes, could have $2,000 headlights, right? That's why we avoid scheduling by dollars. At the end of the day, it's not important that you and I agree on what a category one through five is. The only thing that's important is that everybody in your shop or your business agrees on what a category one, two, three, four, five is. That's the most important thing. And the way to do that is to do a calibration exercise with your entire staff. And also keep in mind that your hours need to include all hours, body, paint, frame, and mechanical. Now, again, some people say, well, Mike, what about scheduling by dollars? Well, you know, I gotta tell you, when I started out in my business, a guy by the name of Bruce King from Team Collision, who was a great mentor to me, shared with me, Mike, I spent it by dollars. The dollars is what I put in the bank. And I did that for many years because that's what my good friend Bruce had coached me on, and it worked really well. But as we started to see these different types of xenon headlights and adaptive cruise controls, we saw that that can skew the average RO in regards to dollars. And so you may have a, you may say, I, I want to do $20,000 worth of work in and out a day, but if I get one Porsche with a xenon headlight and a high dollar bumper, well, that could be a $5,000 repair with only two hours labor on it. So we found out that dollars did not work very well for us. Now, the next thing we did was we said we need to create and assign a color to each category of job. Now, the reason we want to do this is because we do not want to overschedule. But we want to make sure that we, wherever we do our scheduling, whether it's manually, with folders on a wall, or through a management system, that we have specific colors assigned to each category so that if we ever have a no-show or we ever get called up or we're running current, we can pull work in in real time. And rather than having to go through each RO and figure out which one's eight hours or 16 hours, I know that a specific color represents that. And that makes the front end staff, like a CSR, be able to pull that job in in real time. So we assign colors to each ever category. Now again, what we did is we went through in Joe's shop. We saw that for him to do 500,000 a month in sales, he had 48 category ones, 24 category twos, 22 category threes, 17 category fours, and 119 category fives. So what we did is we took then and we went to Google, and Google had a calendar and it showed us, if you look here, how many working days were in each month. So we said, okay, the next month is 20 working days. So what we did is we plotted that work out. And we saw that for Joe to hit $500,000 a month in sales, he needs to bring in and deliver, so arrival and deliver, 2.4 category ones a day, 1.2 category twos, 1.1 category threes, less than one category four, and 5.95 category fives. Now here's the deal. Some people say, Mike, you can't take in a half a car or less than a car. You're absolutely right. So what we did is we said what we're going to do is we'll take in two one day and three the next or we'll take in one day and none the next. So you round it off and then you skip a day. So what we then did was we plotted out Joe's work. And here's what it looked like. Two category ones on Monday, but we had three on Tuesday. Two on Wednesday, the three on Thursday, and so forth. And what we did is we scheduled this work, we said we got this, and we jumped right into it. But what happened was Joe was a DRP for two really large insurance companies. And they sent him a lot of work. And what we saw was that when we booked every day out to capacity, and then he had a DRP show up or a tow show up, we were now overbooked. And what happened was we had too much work. So we said, okay, what are we going to do to allow for these DRP assignments or allow for these tow -ins? So let me share with you what we did next. The first thing is we said that we know that on average, you know, his shop might get five to six tow -ins a week. And we know they're generally going to be kept fours or fives. So we said what we're going to do is we're going to leave open spaces on the estimate or on the team. So you'll see right here where we had five category five scheduled in. We said what we're going to do is we're only going to schedule in maybe three Category 5s, and we'll leave a space open for any of those tow-ins that come in. So what we said we'll do is that if we do not have a tow-in show up by 10 or 11 o'clock, then the CSR, because we kept that space open, the CSR is going to get on the phone or utilize some type of uh, texting or email service, and we're going to pull other customers in earlier that we actually had appointments for. So again, let me phrase this for you, okay? So I leave three spots open every day for unexpected tow-ins. No tow-ins show up by 10 o'clock. My CSR is on the phone, and she's pulling Cat 5s in earlier. Now, if we have a Cat 5 that shows up or Cat 4 that shows up, and we can't get them in that day, and they get towed in, we are going to assign them a, a date. Now, a lot of people feel, Mike, I tell the customer I can't start on it for two weeks, they're going to be mad. Yeah, but what happens if you tell them you can start on it, and they come by two weeks later and you haven't started on it, they're also going to be mad. Again, communication is critical and crucial, and you have to be proactive. The next thing we realized was that 
some shops are actually RX shops, you know, they get six to eight cars consistently every day, but there's some days they don't. So what we did is we said, okay, let's figure out how many ERP assignments you get on average. Let's say you're a Geico ARX and you get in six a day. Well, then let's leave six slots open. But again, by 10 or 11 o'clock, if those, and the Geico appraiser generally knows, and the professional appraiser, they know what kind of assignments they're getting in that day. If they don't have any work scheduled to come in that day for an assignment or estimate or drop off, then again, that's where the CSR is going to get on the phone and pull these customers in in real time. Now, some people say, well, Mike, again, they have that negative story. Well, what about this? What about that? What if I can't see the vehicle? Well, that's where some of the shops I've worked with have developed apps where the customer can actually send them a text or an email with photos of the vehicle. And then they schedule it based on what that damage looks like. So that was the simple answer to that. Now, this is what Joe's schedule looked like after we took into account some of the DRPs and fill-ins. We say, well, leave three slots open every single day, one cat one, one cat two, one three, one four, three cat fives. But again, if we don't get a tow in or a DRC assignment by 10 or 11 o'clock, then we're going to bring customers that we have scheduled out. We're going to bring them in sooner. Now, the next thing people always talk to me about is they get all negative and they say, well, Mike, the insurance company won't pay for rentals over the week. My customers won't drop off Thursdays or Fridays. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got to quit telling ourselves that negative story. In addition, any insurance carriers that are on this webinar, I would love the opportunity to have a conversation with you, respectfully and professionally, to share with you some of the findings that Frank and I have found when we actually did statistical studies on people dropping off cars Monday to Friday, but that's a seminar for another day. So Thursdays and Fridays. First of all, I agree that in most cases you think it's difficult to schedule people on Thursdays and Fridays. And most people argue with me and say, well, Mike, only about 20% of my customers will schedule on Thursdays or Fridays. But I gotta tell you, ladies and gentlemen, you're wrong. A great friend of mine, Aaron Marshall from Marshall Auto Body uh, in Wisconsin, he shared a very good strategy with me. He said, Mike, what we need to do is we need to backfill or ask our customers to schedule Thursday and Friday before we fill up Mondays, Tuesdays, or Wednesdays because it increases our odds. I said, Aaron, what do you mean by that? And here's what he said. He said, well, Mike, here's what happened. This is Jones Paul. His name is Jones. Uh, when's your next appointment? I can get you in on Monday. And then we schedule Mr. Jones in on two, Monday, and then Mr. Anderson in on Monday, and then Mr. Fincher in on four or Monday, and then Mr. Trapp in on Monday, and then the next customer sh shows up and we schedule them on Tuesday, and then the next customer shows up, we schedule them on Wednesday, and the next customer shows up, and we throw our next appointment Thursday, and they see Thursday doesn't work for me, and boom, we schedule them in on Monday. We just overschedule. We just overbook. We just blew up our schedule. So here's the deal. If I know that I want to take in five cars a day, five Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, that's 25 people I'm trying to schedule in on a week. Well, if I fill my first five in on Monday, my second five on Tuesday, my third five on Wednesday, it only allows me 10 people to try to convince on a Thursday and Friday. But if I try to fill my Thursday and Fridays first, now I've got 25 people to try to convince to schedule in on a Thursday or Friday. So therefore, now the odds are in my favor. It's the law of averages, right? So here do we see, Mrs. Jones, our next one is Thursday. That doesn't work for me. All right, well, we'll take it on Monday. Then we tell the next person, Mr. Aviola, our next one is Thursday. You know what, Mike, that works for me. And what we do is we now start back filling Thursday and Friday, and it makes it easier for us to fill in those days of the week. Now I'm going to share another tip with you that I did when I had my shop, and that was this. We simply put a note on our calendar, that our front office calendar that says, ask us about our Thursday and Friday drop-off session. And people will say, what's the Thursday Friday drop-off session? Well, if you drop your call on a Thursday or Friday, we give you a free detail. The reality is, ladies and gentlemen, we're cleaning their cars anyway. Or maybe we give them a $10 Starbucks gift card. Or maybe we give them a free 15-point inspection. But we always ran these specials where we said, ask us about our Thursday and Friday drop-off specials. And ladies and gentlemen, I will tell you, if you're listening on this webinar today, we had tons of customers that said, you know what, I don't need a rental car, I'm going on a weekend, that works perfect for me, and you'll pick my car for me? Absolutely. And we found that Thursdays and Fridays was our easiest days to fill up. So again, I encourage you just to put a simple note on your front counter that says, ask us about our Thursday and Friday drop-off specials. Now, some people say, well, Mike, you know, rental cars, uh, you know, the interest they won't pay for rental cars over the weekend. Well, you know what, first of all, rental agencies sometimes have flexibility on the weekends, because not all their cars are rented. So maybe you can work with your local enterprise ranch, uh, branch and just ask them, are there some things you can do to work out maybe a, a different rate on the weekend, or maybe you work with an insurance company. You know, I'll tell you about a shop I worked with down in North Carolina, and when I started working with them, they were doing about three to 400000 a month in sales. Today, they do about 600000 a month in sales. And that shop, when we started working with them, they did work for a specific insurance company that said, we won't take cars in on Thursdays or Fridays. We don't pay for rentals over the weekend. I went to that insurance company on behalf of the shop and said, look, 
we're going to schedule cars on Thursdays and Fridays. The shop will pay for the rental cars over the weekends. But if in 30 days they don't have the best length of rental in the entire state, then we'll continue to pay for rentals on the weekends. But if they do have the best length of rental, we need you to step up and let us schedule. After three weeks, the person that was a high executive with that insurance care company, let us say his name was Paul, he reached out to the shop and said, I don't know what you're doing, but it's working, and you, your cycle time is almost four days better than anybody else in your area. Take all the cars you win on on Thursdays and Fridays. So I think, ladies and gentlemen, and insurers and shops, we need to have some positive dialogue and look at statistical data about this you know, myth of not taking cars in on weekends. All right, next thing. Here's what that shop looked like for Joe. We said, okay, we're going to take a car in from 8 to 9. We have a second team that's a car from 9 to 10 because Joe was running two teams or what we call two cells. Next car is 10 to 11, 11 to 12. And what we saw was we saw that now we're allowing each team two hours to do an accurate disinfection as well as an accurate repair plan. And here's what we saw. Not only do we see the shop's cycle time decrease, sales go up, but we also saw their supplement ratio go down because they had time to write a more thorough estimate versus writing a halfway estimate and uploading it because they had too many cars to get to. Now, what is the biggest obstacle to scheduling? Owners and friends of the owners. I go into shops all the time, and you'll have Chris. Chris will say, Mr. Jones, we can't get you until Thursday. She's like, well, Joe around. My buddy Joe, we went to school together. And then all of a sudden, you know, hey, Joe, how you doing? Lifelong buddy. Remember we went to school together? We played football. Man, Joe, your, your guy up front says you can't get me until Thursday, man. Is there anybody you can work me in? And Joe's like, yeah, give me the keys. I'll take care of you. Ladies and gentlemen, the biggest obstacle to scheduling is owners and friends of the owners. I always tell people, I don't need friends because all I want to do is borrow money, money or bump cigarettes. So get ready to those friends, ladies and gentlemen, and focus on your customers. All right, next thing is we create a visual system. And that was we needed to create a system that somebody in the front office, if we needed to pull work in in real time because there were no tow-ins or DRP assignments, it would make it very easy for them to identify which jobs to bring in first. So there's a couple ways we did that. One is we some shops like visual controls and like bins on the wall. Again, I'm all about being paperless. The folders were just a visual control. Uh, Exalta had something that was called a magnetic scheduling board that was developed by Aaron Marshall and Steve Trapp and others at Team Exalta. And then your management system may have something like what Topinet calls a work plan. So let's look through this very quickly. The first is, for some shops, they like visual controls. We hung racks on the wall, right? Now, again, it does look kind of you know shoddy, doesn't look too good on your walls. But what we did is we actually just used different color folders to represent the category of jobs. So we said, OK, you can see on June 1st, June 2nd, the numbers in the bins represent the day of the week. And then what we did is the color of the folder actually showed what type of job that was. So let's just say the green was a category one. If I knew I needed to bring a category one in sooner, I could go to the bin, see all the green folders, and know who I need to bring in sooner. All right? Sometimes people will take folders and they'll actually assign colored dots, like a blue dot may be a category one or a green dot may be a category two. Again, the color is a visual control. Now, here's another shop that we work with, and they had bins on the walls. This shop had about a six-week backlog. This was Dare Allen, down at uh, Dare Allen Body Shop in North Carolina. Um, and then we worked with Exalta, and Exalta actually came up with a scheduling board. This is a magnetic board, and they had five different color magnets. Each magnet uh, represented a category. You could write on this with a dry erase marker. So instead of a bunch of bins on your walls, you could actually just take and write the customer's information. You put the magnet on there, and that helps you to determine which cars you need to pull in, in real time. And then obviously, if you're using PropNet as a management system, PropNet allows you to run and set your hours by labor category. And then they also have a dashboard that will allow you to see what your cycle time is, arrivals versus deliveries per day. So you don't have to use an Excel spreadsheet and see how many cars you took in Monday through Friday and how many you delivered. Again, this line should be right on top of each other. We can also in PropNet see how much your cycle time is for your free repair, your repair and post repair. And then we can also look at that by category versus month. So again, and also in ProfitNet, they have a job scheduling feature that when you go into this, you can actually look at different colors that determine where your slots are open at. Now, the type of scheduling is scheduling by technician efficiency. I and mean, really, this isn't so much about scheduling, it is about dispatch, who gets the next job. Let's say, for example, I have technician A who's 100% efficient. That means they can complete 40 hours of work in a 40-hour work week. So if that technician had 20 hours assigned to them, then they're at 50% capacity. Think about it that their gas tank is half full. That means their fill rate to fill them up to full is 50%. Now, technician B, they're 150% efficient. That means they can complete 60 hours in a 40-hour work week. And let's say this technician has 20 hours assigned to them. They're at 33% capacity, and their fill rate to get them back up to a full tank of gas is 67%. 
And then we have technician C, who's 200% efficient. That means they can complete 80 hours in a 40-hour work week. They only have 20 hours assigned to them. They're only at 25% capacity. They only have a quarter of a tank of gas, and they need three quarters of a tank of gas to get them filled back up. So the question is, who gets the next job? Well, if you said technician C, you were absolutely correct. Because technician C is the technician that needs the most work to get back to a full tank if we're trying to keep everybody even. Now, another thing that we like to talk about also when you dispatch your work is understanding if you have a technician, individual technicians, which by the way, I think individual start to finish is one by the wayside, and we're looking more at a team or a cell system. But also make sure that you understand how many hard hits category five that technician can handle. Now, most management systems I work with, much like Propanet, will allow you to put the technician's efficiency in the management system. And then what happens is when you go to run a report, it tells you how much work they have assigned, how many hours they've been flagged, and how many hours are available. And you say, well, Mike, I don't use ProfitNet. I don't use any management system. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you need to be using the management system. If you're doing more than $800,000 a year in sales, you need a management system. Trust me, right? So let's just say that you have a management system, though, that can't pull from the data I've shared with you. There are several things you can do. Number one is at Exalta, we built something that was called a cycle time tracker, which, again, was developed by Ron Pomato. And what it was, it was a cycle time tracker where the shops could put in their ROs each month, and then it would help them to understand how many uh, cars they took in, how many they delivered, what the pre-repair cycle time was, the repair cycle time, or the post-repair. So this was an Excel spreadsheet, again, that I'm sure you could develop, or if not, reach out to me at Christian Advice, and we'll be glad to try to help you uh, do something with this, right? So you could do this manually through Excel. Uh, again, you'll see here category ones, category twos, threes, and fours, and fives. And so it kind of just shows you what your arrivals versus deliveries are and shows you what days maybe you're not scheduling very well. The next option to you is uh, Enterprise, our good friends at Enterprise. And by the way, I just want to say thank you to Enterprise for all they do to support me at Collision Place personally. Um, is that uh, Enterprise uh, provided us data for some shops where we wanted to see how many cars they were taking in Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, and what our length of rental was per day. So you saw right here, this was Repair Center 1. We took the shop's names out. We saw that on Sundays, they opened up less than 1% of their ROs. We saw that on Mondays, they were actually taking in 48% of their cars. Tuesday, they were taking in 20% of their cars. Wednesday, 16% of their cars. Thursday, 7.6% of their cars. And Fridays, 4% of their cars. First, we look at Repair Center number 2. Uh, they were actually only taking in 29% of their cars on a Monday versus Repair Center 1 was taking in 48%. So the bottom line is it was really important for us to look at what the length of rental was and how many cars people were loading up on. So if your management system won't give you, I would encourage you to reach out to your local branch manager and enterprise. This is a special report that they have to pull for you. It's not something that's commonplace, so it may take a little time, so be patient with them. So what we did is we had enterprise pull some data for some shops that we worked with that didn't have access to that management system. By the way, this is some data from 2014 that uh, enterprise provided to us. As far as the length of rental, for the average day of the week for both drivable and non-drive. Now, a lot of people will argue, Mike, the length of rental on cars on Fridays is a lot worse than the cars taken on Monday, so I should take more cars in on Monday. Yeah, I would agree with that. But ladies and gentlemen, remember, you're, ma you're measured on your overall length of rental, not just your length of rental on Mondays. When insurance companies look at your length of rental, they look at it for the total month, every single day, not one specific day. Now, let me show a little case study that we did. So uh, Frank and I worked together on this. Uh, we had our good friends at Enterprise. We were working with an MSO. This was a 28-store uh, MSO. And what we did is we reached out to our good friends at Enterprise and we said, uh, could you tell us how many cars this shop takes in on Mondays? Yeah, so what we did is we said, hey, Enterprise, can you tell us, Repair Center 1, if they do 100 cars a month, how many of those get dropped off on a Monday versus Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday? So we saw that all the shops on the left, 1 through 13, they took in the majority of their cars in on a Monday. You see 49, 46, 43, 38% of their cars they brought in on a Monday. So what we did is we went to the second 28 shops, shops number 14 through 28, and we said, look, we want you to really be conscious and aware about trying to take less cars in on Monday and more cars in on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays. So the first 14, we said, just do things the way you do it, right? The other 14, we created an awareness with them. So every single day, we would send them a report that says, Here's how many cars you've taken in on Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, Friday. And we just kept bringing it to their attention every single day. So it became like a game where they started trying to take less cars on Monday and more in on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And you'll see on the right-hand side that those shops started, some of those shops started taking in like only like 26% of their cars in on a Monday. 
And you'll see what happens if you look at Repair Center number 27, 28. They actually had length of rental of less than eight days. And what we saw is when we took the first 14 shops, their average length of rental was 10.36 days. But the shops that focused on taking work in consistently Monday through Friday, their length of rental was 9.15 days. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, they were able to decrease their overall length of rental by one day. That's a pretty big deal. I've heard the number floated around with State Farm that the State Farm pays out an average of 48 to $49 million a day for rental car costs. Well, at the end of the day, we just saved $48 million, right? So at the end of the day, I really believe as an industry, we need to focus more on consistent scheduling. Now, other scheduling considerations is don't ever exceed your buffer by more than 20%. So if you're going to schedule in by hours for your technicians, if you if, say you want to schedule in 20 hours a day and you take in 24 hours, people can come in early and stay late to get yourself out of that bind. But when you start exceeding 20% buffer on your scheduling, whether it's cars or hours, generally it's going to be a little bit difficult to work out of that. So never exceed your buffer by 20%. The next thing is if you're going to schedule or dispatch work based off of labor hours, like the scenario I showed you with technician A, B, and C, it's, there's a couple key points here. Make sure you assign the labor to the technician. Number two, make sure when they do the job, they get flagged. If not, it's going to give you a false read. So again, make sure the technician assigned the labor, make sure the labor is flagged. Again, every management system does this differently. Here's just an example out of PropNet that shows you uh, what percentage of how many hours this technician has assigned to them, what percentage they've completed, and what's available to them. Uh, some management systems, again, like this, have a flag sheet. It shows you the technician has 60 hours capacity. They've got 97 hours assigned to them. They've been flagged 68 hours, and therefore they have 28 hours remaining. So they're basically at 50% capacity. So again, lots of data to talk about. I know I've gone through this rather quickly. I do believe that Sika is going to make this uh, presentation available to everybody in a recorded session. I want to encourage you that if you uh, have any questions on this, if you disagree, you agree, you want more information, please feel free to contact me at my cell or my email address. I would love to discuss scheduling with you, something I'm very passionate about. And I just want to challenge, again, the insurers in a respectful and professional manner, is that I would ask you just to kind of think outside the box in regards to scheduling. So one of the things I've seen in my travels is in Canada, they, they actually have where the Shops have online scheduling, and, and, and the insurance companies build their, build their buckets where they have availability at or capacity, and I think that works really well. So, um, Fred and Charlie, I, I appreciate you having me, and um, just I, we can open it up for about five minutes worth of questions before I have to head to the airport and jump on a plane, guys. Uh, we got we got to continue moving on, uh, Mike, uh, but uh, to the audience, uh, as you saw from this presentation, uh, scheduling is very data intensive. Uh, and the SECA standards make the efficient and effective collection of all of that data possible. So that's that's where we as SECA and you know come in uh, to play on this. And Mike has uh, provided some very interesting uh, insights. Uh, I'd like to turn this over to uh, and give me a second to switch this out. Uh, yes. Yeah, so Fred and Charlie, I'm at the head of the airport. But okay. please, again, anybody that has any questions. Feel free to email me at mike at collisionadvice.com. Again, that's mike at collisionadvice.com. Or if you'd like to schedule a time to speak about scheduling, I'll be glad to speak to anyone. Feel free to reach out to my assistant, Tiffany Driggers. Again, her name is Tiffany Driggers at 703-898-0715. Again, that number is 703-898-0715. One five. And just contact Tiffany, and she'll get your name, and she'll schedule a time for us to talk. That she knows we're on every between flights or whatever. And I'd love to chat with anybody, insurers, uh, management system companies, shops, whatever. And I just want to make a positive outcome. So again, thank you guys. God bless, and have a great day, Fred. Thank you. All right, Fred. Um, so this is Frank Laviola here, and really, I think what we want to do as far as Sika is really explain. How does SECA fit into the scheduling? And Mike went through and did a great job of talking about um, how shops should do scheduling and things like that. But what's interesting is really everything that Mike's talked about and what we're going to talk about has been created by SECA with the SECA messages to support the industry participants to be able to easily communicate within each, uh, together with scheduling. 
Um, so Sika messages, go to the next slide, Fred. Sika messages, um, taking scheduling to the next step and going electronic and be beyond your walls to other companies with Sika standards. These enable us to, you got to go back one, Fred. You're off. Sorry. Go back to the next slide, please. All right. Next one. There you go. Go to the next one. I'm sorry. It was off on mine. So if we look at scheduling appointment messages, we can check on appointment availability. We can select an appointment. We can cancel and then rebook an appointment and confirm an appointment. And we can also schedule and report on class inspections. And really, uh, everything that you think about with what Mike showed today is here. It's just it's scheduling it into your system rather than using boards or um, very manual processes. And this work has already been completed by SECA, and it allows you to do all of these things. Next slide, please. So what's next? SECA is working on mobile standards for your customers to gain access to your scheduling process. So imagine mobile computing for your customer. Moving into the generation that we see businesses from banks to dentists and even hairstylists today doing, um, reducing your phone call volume in and out. This is going to be very important as we go and shops increase their input, start using scheduling systems, and communicate with our customers effectively from a CSI standpoint. Next slide. Sika developed these slides uh, for you to do more than just scheduling appointments also. So Sika has a full suite of messages. And when we talk about messages, what we're talking about is communication between all parties within the industry, from insurance companies to collision repair shops to information providers, parts companies, rental car vendors, all of these companies communicating together to schedule for you. But there's other uh, messages that have been created. So these are assignment messages that allow you to receive assignments electronically, estimate messages, attachment messages, parts and material messages, um, authorization messages. Really important for shops today, I think, is invoicing statements and remittance messages. And of course, the scheduling messages, very, very important. And Sika, again, has all of this already completed. What Sika is really asking is for folks on this call, um, especially shop customers and vendors, to reach out to your information providers and ask them to embrace the BMS messages that re it relates to scheduling. And what does it do? It improves efficiency. It reduces the cycle time. It reduces the overall cost, which we know in this day and age is very important to all parties involved. And it improves customer satisfaction. And I think Mike went through and showed a lot of data that showed how cycle time was significantly impacted. And we all know that through JD Power, when that happens, um, CSI improves, customer satisfaction improves. And that's what we're all about today, making sure that we take care of these customers in a very positive way so that they come back, tell customers about us, and talk about a very positive experience they had with the repair shop. Go to the next one. So I'm going to end this today um, very quickly through Sika. If you would like to have more information on this and you'd like what you've seen that Mike's presented, you just need to understand that all of this is already out there as far as, uh, we'll call it technology, communication between partners. And Seek is putting on these webcasts so that the shops and the people involved in the industry really reach out to those folks who kind of hold the key to turning this switch on for things like scheduling. Um, if you want more information on this, it would be best to, uh, to contact Charlie Quirk, charlie at sika.com. And, and again, contact your information suppliers and vendor partners and ask about the Sika business messaging. Well, thank you, Mike, and thank you, Frank. Uh, but mostly thank you, the, our audience, for participating today. Please join us at our next Sika cast and at our annual symposium on September 12th through the 14th in Indianapolis. Thank you and have a great day. This concludes the Sika cast.